Chapter 8. The Landings In December 1963, Los Alamos received a message from the Eben planet, confirming all the details of the landing. The message specified the time, date, and location that had previously been agreed up on. All the numbers were stated using our location, time, and date protocols. The message told us that two Eben spaceships were already on their way, and would arrive on schedule. We learned later that the journey took about 10 months, so that means that the Eben spacecraft had been en route from Serpo for about 6 months of Earth time when the message was received. President Kennedy had been assassinated only a few weeks earlier, and the entire nation was still in mourning at that point. Some of the DIA project coordinators wanted to cancel the exchange program. The fate of the mission was then left to President Lyndon B. Johnson. He was briefed by the mission planners and made the decision to continue with the exchange, although, we are told in a side note by Anonymous, that the president didn't really believe that it would happen. It is interesting to note here that, apparently, President Kennedy had not informed then-Vice President Johnson about Project Crystal Knight. This is surprising, because Johnson had been appointed by Kennedy to be head of the Space Council. Evidently, Kennedy had been told by MJ-12 that the project information could not be shared with Johnson or with the President's cabinet. As the landing date approached, the team was ready and idle, and probably enjoying some well-deserved rest and recreation although they remained under surveillance the whole time. Their training had been completed, and they had been given a 15-day vacation. In the time just before the April landing date, they were sent back to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas, and were confined in locked cells in the U.S. Disciplinary barracks and kept under close watch. This reflected the almost fanatical dedication to secrecy by the planning committee. They were simply not taking any chances, no matter how remote, that information about the impending mission might be revealed. One can easily appreciate how depressed the team must have been to have been treated like criminals on the eve of what should have been a grand send-off on a historically momentous and extraordinary journey to the stars. In another time, under a different, less paranoid government, they might have been sent off to the strains of patriotic music, broadcast on international television, and with a cheering crowd in attendance. The two alien craft entered our atmosphere on the afternoon of April 24, 1964, right on schedule. These were not scout craft, but were much larger and were considered shuttle craft. The first ship missed the rendezvous point and landed somewhere near Socorro, New Mexico. This was about a hundred miles north of the planned landing site. We sent a message to the craft that it had landed at the wrong place. The second ship picked up the message and made the navigation correction. It landed shortly thereafter at the precise designated location at White Sands, where a greeting party waited. It can be assumed that it was late afternoon at that point, although it could have been nighttime, as was shown in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Since we don't know where Steven Spielberg obtained his information, we don't know how accurate it was. But it was distinctly possible that night had fallen by the time the alien craft had landed, and, presumably, the planning committee was prepared for that contingency with appropriate lighting, as in the movie. We are not told what happened to the first craft. More than likely, it also flew to the correct location. The greeting group consisted of 16 senior government and military officials. Anonymous does not give the identities of these people, but most probably President Johnson was not among them. The 12 team members waited in a bus nearby. 45 tons of supplies and equipment stood ready to load onto the alien ship. A canopy was in place connecting the landing point with the waiting officials. A contingent of Ebens disembarked from the craft and walked under the canopy. Movie cameras and tape recorders were rolling. The Eben official presented us with some technology gifts. Anonymous says, the Ebens had a crude translator device. It appeared to be some sort of microphone with a readout screen. The senior U.S. official was given one of the devices, and the Eben kept the other one. The official spoke into the device and the screen showed a printed form of the voice message, both in Eben, and in English. It was crude and hard to understand everything that was said. Direct translation was also provided by one of the aliens who was designated EB-2. This was a female who spoke decent English. She later became an invaluable resource on Serpo. EB-2 presented us with the yellow book. 
This was a remarkable and generous gift to the people of Earth and clearly demonstrated the aliens wish to become our galactic friends. About the Yellow Book, Anonymous says. It isn't exactly a book. It is a block of material, approximately two and a half inches thick, and transparent in nature and appearance. The reader looks at the transparent surface and suddenly words and pictures appear. It is an endless series of historical stories and photographs of our universe, the Eben planet and their former home world, and other interesting stories about the universe. It also contains an historical story, and various accounts about Earth's history and distant past. I am one of the very few people who has actually seen the Yellow Book. As has been commented on by others, it would take a lifetime to read it and another lifetime to understand it. The Yellow Book also describes the Eben involvement with the evolution of human civilizations on Earth. Evidently, as we learned later, there were some controversial claims made in this regard that caused some recipients of the information to doubt the veracity of the material, which brought up the possibility that these claims were intended to accomplish a hidden diplomatic agenda. On this subject Anonymous says, If one reads the Yellow Book and reads between the lines, one would come away with the thought and clear impression that the Ebens had something to do with Jesus Christ, or possibly, Jesus was one of them. Also, if you look at some events that are shown in the Yellow Book, you can connect some incidents, such as Fatima, etc., with an Eben landing. We learned later that it was E.B. too, who had translated the book into English. The Ebens informed us at that time that they had reconsidered the timing of the exchange program, and wished to reschedule it for a later date. They preferred to only retrieve the bodies of their dead compatriots on this trip, and to return to Earth in July 1965 to accomplish the exchange of personnel. This posed an enormous logistical problem for us, since all the equipment and supplies would now have to be warehoused somewhere, and we would have to keep the team motivated and in a highly secure facility for another year. There were also possible political ramifications that could change our willingness to continue with the program if the Johnson administration decided to cancel it. The aliens took the bodies of the nine Ebens, who had died in the two Roswell crashes, as well as the body of EB-1, on board, we had performed autopsies on some of the bodies. The remains had been kept at Los Alamos Laboratories in a special state-of-the-art cryogenic facility. The visit lasted about four hours. The film and audio recordings of the entire event had been stored in a vault at Bowling Air Force Base in Washington, D.C. The time selected for the return visit was July 16, 1965. It was agreed that this time the landing location would be the northern section of the Nevada test site. About this choice, Anonymous says, planners did not wish to keep the same location for fear that something might leak. Once again, the extreme security concern becomes evident. The team members were returned to their lockup at Fort Leavenworth for one month, and then were sent back to Camp Peary to hone their original training and to learn some new skills. This gave them all, but especially the linguists, a chance to improve their ability to understand and speak the Eben language. The linguists were now able to achieve a passable fluency with the high-pitched sing-song speech, but the other team members struggled with the bizarre language. As before at Camp Peary, the 12 team members remained isolated in their own little community within the larger CIA training facility and did not communicate with anyone other than their trainers. This period coincided with the first year of the Vietnam War, in which the CIA Special Operations Group played an important role, so the camp must have been a very busy place while the team was there. In April 1965, they were sent back to jail again at Fort Leavenworth to wait out the final three months. By this time, they must have begun to feel like real prisoners, and probably wondered what strange political concerns could have justified such harsh treatment. It is likely that the team morale must have then reached an all-time low, although the mounting excitement and anticipation of the rapidly approaching departure date probably helped to offset their depression. The two Eben shuttles returned right on schedule on July 16, 1965. This time they landed at the northern section of the Nevada test site, as planned. The diplomatic niceties having been attended to in their previous visit, this was strictly a working meeting. The 12 team members waited in a bus, as before, and the military vans were poised to unload their massive cargo, consisting of 90,500 pounds of supplies, equipment, and vehicles. I think we can safely assume that there had been extensive communications between Los Alamos and Serpo in the intervening year to refine the arrangements, but Anonymous makes no reference to this. The team boarded the Eben shuttlecraft, 
and the cargo was loaded by military personnel onto one of the craft. Three M151 Vietnam era jeeps, like this one were taken on board. The team boards the alien ship, similar to the one from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The massive size of this ship can be appreciated when we learn that the entire cargo fit into a single level of the three-level craft. The lone Eben ambassador disembarked from the shuttle and was taken away in a military vehicle. He was then sent to the alien facility at Los Alamos Laboratories. Understandably, the team had no intention of allowing the rigid protocols of the planners to infect their ranks by referring to each other robotically by three-digit numbers. They quickly adopted suitable nicknames for each member, but never used their real names. They did, however, use the number names for more formal and written communications. The team commander, an Air Force colonel, became Skipper, the two doctors were Doc 1, and Doc 2, and the pilots were referred to as Sky King and Flash Gordon. Anonymous doesn't supply the other nicknames. A comment sent to the Serpo website in March 2006, points out an interesting reference that adds authenticity to the entire Serpo story. He reminds us that in the golden days of radio, Sky King was a very popular kid series, along with The Lone Ranger, The Green Hornet, and many others. Sky King ran on radio from 1946 to 1954, and then a TV version was produced and shown from 1951 to 1959. The TV show reruns were telecast on Saturday afternoons up until 1966. So the show was still on television when the team departed in July 1965. The comment contributor says, Most people today have either never heard of Sky King or have long forgotten about him. However, it wouldn't be surprising that a young pilot in 1965 would have adopted the nickname of Sky King. A pilot who was about 35 when the mission departed would have been an impressionable teenager in the 1950s, and probably watched the TV show. If he was 40, he probably lay on the living room carpet like millions of other kids of that era, glued to the radio when Sky King came over the airwaves. Could that young boy ever, in his wildest dreams, have imagined that he would one day be among the first earthlings to depart the earth to travel to a distant star system? Poster for the TV version of Sky King from the 1950s the team commander kept a diary from the first moment of the mission. Anonymous supplied the following account of that first day from that diary. Here, for posterity, is the skipper's exact entry for those first scary moments of that historic mission. Anonymous doesn't explain the acronyms, but we can be quite certain that the M refers to mission in each case. MTC might be Mission Training Coordinator, and MVC is probably the Mission Voyage Coordinator, who we find out later does not speak English very well and travels with the team. Consequently, he must be an Eben. Day 1 We are ready. Hard to think we finally made it. Team is motivated and calm. Final briefing by MTC and MTB. Cargo packed in EB craft. Might have some problems with guns. We'll be talking to the MVC. 899 and 203 will have overall charge of weapons. No sync system or we don't know about them. Everything moving smoothly. 700 and 754 will give each member final check before boarding. Okay, we loaded everything and it fits. But we have to transfer all of it to the bigger ship once we get to rendezvous point. Really excited about this. No reservations by anyone. MTC asked all members to make final decision. The team all said go. We go. Interior of EB craft is big. There are three levels, this is different than the one we trained on. I think that was a scout craft, this one is a shuttle craft. We stored the cargo in lower level. We will sit in the center level and the crew will sit in the upper level. Strange looking walls. They seem to be dimensional. There are three stations, four of us will sit in each station. No seats just benches. We wouldn't fit in those small crew seats. The MVC says we don't need anything special, no O2 or helmets. Don't know what to do with them. Okay, final checks. MTC gave us final words. We pray, he said. We board the EB craft. 475, really nervous. 700, we'll watch him. The hatch is closed. No windows. We can't see out. Everyone is seated in their respective seats on the bench. 
no retention harnesses. Okay, well, bar across us. The craft is starting engine, or what they call energy thrusters. Seems like we are moving but nothing is happening inside. Still able to write this. Really dizzy now. 102 sitting next to me and he has fainted. Something feels really funny. Have to rewrite this because I can't think straight. When the commander says, we loaded everything and it fits, it may be that the actual loading was done by an Air Force ground crew, since it doesn't seem appropriate that this highly trained team would be expected to perform such arduous labor, that is, loading 90,500 pounds of equipment and supplies, although judging from the way they had been treated thus far, it wouldn't necessarily be out of the question. In fact, that may very well be what happened, since a ground crew would have to have had very high security clearances. The statement one prey said was probably meant to be one prayer, and would seem to accord with the chapel scene in Close Encounters where the clergyman delivers a final prayer to the team, and refers to them as pilgrims. Since the commander says, still able to write this, it appears that, at this stage, his diary was handwritten, although we learn later that the diaries of all the other team members were recorded on cassette tape. Eventually, the commander also reverted to voice recording.